Okay, so welcome everyone. Today we have we are going to discuss types of discourses. But before I start, I need to be sure that all of you are hearing me loudly and clearly. So am I audible? Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So let me mute everyone and then I share my screen. Today we have types of discourses. Last, in our last class we were discussing definitions. And I use the opportunity to welcome the students from the College of Basic and Applied Sciences. I'm hoping that the new members of this group have gone through our previous lectures so that they can make a sense of this class. But whatever is the case, I wish you the best in catching up. Types of discourses. What is a discourse? Everyone should mute their mics. Let me see. Is anyone not muting his mic? Jasmine, Rich, Richard, and Sandra, mute your mics. Okay. So what is a discourse? Sometimes when we write, we put individual sentences together for different purposes. A collection of sentences is called a passage or a discourse. So basically when you've put different several sentences together, what you have is a passage, which we call a discourse in critical thinking or logic. Now we shall distinguish passages that are arguments and those that are not. So you can see that at the beginning of this course, we are already trying to distinguish those aspects of communication that are not arguments. Since our business in this course is to focus on arguments, we are taking our time to spell out all those forms of communications that are not, are not, are not arguments and then to let you see the reasons why they are not arguments. You know? So that's the purpose of this class. Now to distinguish passages that are arguments from those that are not, we go to the next slide. Argument. An argument is a discourse that contains a claim or conclusion, which is supported with reasons or information. A discourse that contains a claim or conclusion which is supported with reasons or information. So basically an argument contains at least two items. Two items. First, it must have a conclusion which could also be a claim or a decision. And then secondly, there should be expressions aimed at providing support or proof for the conclusion, claim or decision. So we have two components in an argument. Or an argument has two components. There must be a conclusion, which you can call a claim or a decision, or them, and then there must be expressions that aim to provide support or proof for the conclusion. So those are the two components of an argument. So example of an argument, Statement one, Ghanaian men think women don't deserve to occupy high positions. Statement two, they question the competence and qualification of women who are sent to high office, but refrain from doing same to even incompetent men. So that's statement two. Statement three, therefore Ghanaian men do not respect women. So notice that the both passages are three statements. Statements one and two are serving as information, evidence or reasons to support statement three. Statements one and two are providing evidence or reasons or information to support statement three. For attempting to support statement three, those statements are called premises. Premises. So statements one and two are premises. And then statement 
so, uh, st uh, sorry, and then statement three, which is being supported is called conclusion. So statements one and two are premises and three is a conclusion. And if you look at the structure of the statements, you see why the, the first two are premises and then the last one is the conclusion. Even by looking at the first wording of the last statement, you see that it begins with therefore. So therefore suggests that you are making a conclusion. Then how do we identify arguments? Right now, I just hinted at one major way of identifying arguments. You can identify arguments by looking at the structure and message and message of the statements. And then from statement three, you could see that it has the structure of a conclusion, you know. It, it, it is like it's a summation of the first two statements. It, it is like an interpretation of the first two statements, you know. Ghanaian men do not respect women. It tells you in the shortest words, all you need to know from statements one and two. In fact, it is like a deduction from statements one and two, you know. It is like where you are all gossiping or, you know, discussing and some people are making statements one and two and then Someone, someone like you will say, okay, it means they don't respect women. So that's technically a conclusion. But there are, there are other ways of, there are other ways of identifying conclusions and premises. In other words, identifying an argument in a passage. To identify an argument in a passage, there are certain indicators. There are certain words and phrases that indicate you are looking at a premise. And all, there are also certain words and indicators that are uh, words and uh, phrases that indicate you are looking at a conclusion. Now, we call them indicators. We have the premise indicators, we have the conclusion indicators. Now, these are, ex these are examples of premise indicators. When you see statements that begin with for, or granted that, or in view of the fact that, or in as much as, or since, such words or phrases suggest to you that you are looking at a premise or a sentence that begins with, it is a fact that, it is a fact that, you know. Now bear in mind that premises are supposed to provide evidence or facts to support a conclusion. So when you see a statement that begins with, it is a fact that, obviously you know that the aim of that sentence is to provide facts. So that is the job of a premise. Yeah. But when you see a sentence that begins with, one cannot doubt that, you know, that's a premise. Because normally in arguments, we'll begin with statements about what all of us know. And then we aim to land at a statement that none of us knows, you know. An argument is supposed to begin with something about what we all know, and then to take us from what we all know to what we don't know. That's normally the job of an argument. An, an argument is supposed to take us from the known to the unknown, you know. So when you begin an argument with one cannot doubt that, obviously you are going somewhere. You are beginning with what we all don't doubt so that you take us to what some of us have not considered. So if a statement that begins with the phrase, one, one cannot doubt that is, is the premise. The same thing goes with statements that begin with because, or the reason is that. Now, when you see the, a statement that begins with the phrase, is, the reason is that, Obviously, you should know that that statement is providing reasons for a conclusion. In such a case, it suggests that the conclusion came before the premises. So if you see an argument in which the conclusion came before the premises, the conclusion is stated first, then the, the premise says the reason is that, you know, 
For instance, if a conclusion says Ghanaian men don't respect women, then the premise will say the reason is that, first of all, Ghanaian men uh, do not believe women should occupy high office. And secondly, so, 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 and so, you know. So that would be an example of an argument where the conclusion comes first, and then the premise would have to begin with a phrase such as the reason is that. And then the last one, as shown by the fact that. Now, this list is not exhaustive. There may be other Jenny's Ampong, your microphone is on. And Ama, you have to mute your mics. OK, so I've muted everyone. So these are a few examples. There could be others. This list would not be exhaustive. Then how do we add? There are certain premise, or sorry, there are certain conclusion indicators. So these words or phrases suggest you are looking at, you are looking at a conclusion. You have therefore, consequently, hence, asserting that. Remember that in the example we just saw of an argument, statement three was beginning with um, therefore. You can see the example of an argument. The conclusion began with therefore. So you can actually replace this therefore with any of the other words or phrases in the, among the conclusion indicators. You can replace it with consequently. Consequently, Ghanaian men do not respect women, or hence, you know, or for this reason, Ghanaian men do not respect women, for these reasons, and so on. Now, it is not all arguments, it is not all conclusions and premises that contain conclusion and premise indicators. You can have an argument without any in any of these indicators. You know, you can write your arguments without indicators at all. So you have to learn to identify arguments that don't have indicators. It is, it is just that the indicators make it easier for us to spot or identify arguments. Then the non-arguments. Not every passage or cluster of propositions is an argument. Some passages are non-arguments, such as narratives, instructional passages, rhetorical polemic or opinion. So let's look at them one, by one after the other. What is a narrative? A narrative is a passage that reports a sequence of events. According to the order, the events occurred. Example, over the course of two weeks, some police officers have been ob observed stopping and checking cars in the area between Nsawa and Nanyinam on the Accra Kumasi Road. They extort money and abuse motorists who question their authority. Brandishing AK-47 assault rifles and dressed in heavy police gear. These officers do not just check cars, they also assault some motorists and passengers. So this is this passage is obviously a collection of factual statements, you know. So when you see factual statements collected together with the intention of showing uh, a chronology of events, you know, depicting a series of events from one to the other, then that's a narrative, you know. And obviously, narratives are the easiest kind of passages to detect. You know, it doesn't take you any energy to detect a narrative. All you need is to just see factual statements that are showing a historical development. Then you have instructional passages. An instructional passage is a passage that describes a process or sequence of things to do in a specific order. It offers a list of directives to follow to accomplish some desired effects. Now, the example below offers a list of directives on how to use a fire extinguisher. Example, pull the pin. Aim the nozzle at the base of the fire. Aiming at the top of the flame with the extinguisher won't be effective. 
in a controlled manner, squeeze the trigger to release the agent. Sweep the nozzle from side to side until the fire is put out. So this is an instructional passage on how to use a fire extinguisher. You can see that an instructional passage is simply a collection of imperatives, you know. So when you see imperatives collected together, directed at giving direction on the procedure on something to do, and that's an instru instructional passage. Then you have rhetorical polemic. A rhetorical polemic is a passage communicating a usually strong feeling or unpersuasively vent in an opinion. So for example, I hate these lab tests. Every time I'm exposed to the disease plants, I fall ill. I'm sure they hate me or they are punishing me or something. It's disgusting how I get sick so often. Now this passage shows you that the rhetorical polemic is a collection of emotive expressions. There are emotive expressions. The first statement is, I hate this lab test. That's an emotive expression. The second statement, every time I'm exposed to the disease plants, I fall ill. That's a claim, you know. So it's not it's not an emotive expression, it's a claim. So the second sentence is a claim. And then the third sentence, I'm sure they hate me or they are punishing me or something. That's an emotive expression. And then the fourth sentence is disgusting how I get sick so often. That's an emotive expression. So in this passage, we have four emotive expressions surrounded by one claim, you know. So rhetorical polemics are usually a passage, is usually a passage containing at, at least a claim surrounded by emotive expressions. I think that you, so you, you, most of the time you need to make at least one claim so that someone can make sense of your emotive expression. So the claim is to uh, make your emotive expressions meaningful to someone, to a listener, you know. Okay, so in a rhetorical polemic, you, you could have a claim surrounded by emotive expressions, but in an argument, you have a claim surrounded by reasons a claim surrounded by supporting reasons, reasons that support it. So we make claims in arguments and rhetorics, but in argument, we have to support our claims, but in rhetorical polemic, we are making our claims so that, so that someone can make sense of our emotive expressions. So that's the difference between the two kinds of passages. Now for an exercise, name four types of discourses we studied in this chapter. What is an argument? List the components of an argument and then distinguish between argument and rhetorical polemic. So I need people to answer each of these questions. You can raise your hand if you want to answer. Yeah, so Gloria, you you want to answer the first question? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Okay. So he said an argument is putting sentences together for a different purpose, a collection of sentences together to form a passage or a discourse as an argument. Mm, so on the basis of on the basis of that, you are required to name four types of discourses, depending on the purpose for which the sentences have been put together. So go ahead. What are four types of passages or discourses? And then you have um, Ajay Lawrence. Do you want to answer? Yeah, hello, Doc. 
The four types of discourses are argument, narrative, instructional, and rhetorical polemic. Okay. Yes, and then. Yes, and then um, Portia, do you want to answer question two? Answer question three. Tell us the components of an argument. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so an argument has two components, which is conclusion and then the expression. Expression? Yes. The conclusion is also and, an expression. So which expressions are you Conclusion. Ah, uh, no. Okay. The nice. Uh, Portia, your, your line is breaking. So I think you should uh, write down your answer in the chat room. Okay. Now, Sarah Abena, do you want to answer any of the questions? Yes, please. Sir, please, question four. Thank you. Uh huh. But questions, question two has not been answered. So, answer question four. Okay, sir, please. The difference between argument and rhetorical polemic is with arguments, there is a claim which is surrounded by reasons, whereby rhetorical polemic, rhetorical polemic, there is a claim which is surrounded by emotic expressions. That helps one to understand the claim. Okay, good. So, who answers uh, question two, or was was it properly answered? Hmm. Okay, I have, I have not checked the chat room. Let me see. Where is it? Um. Okay, so now I think we have to go ahead. An argument. I think. Um, the other person had answered uh, a question about arguments. Uh, let me see. I'm just going through the charts. Um, I'm not seeing it, so I, we need to we need to go ahead. So let's see the rest. Let's see the other topics. Verbal and real disputes. Now we have this distinction between verbal and real disputes. And the, uh, uh, the understanding is that majority of the disagreements in this world are based on verbal, you know, are called verbal disagreements because they are disagreements about the meaning of a word, you know. They are not really disagreements about facts or values, but about the, what a, a word or a concept means. Maybe one of the parties doesn't understand what the concept means, or probably it, is, it might not even be the fault of both parties. Maybe the meaning of the concept itself is, is contestable. And so it's a verbal disagreement. Um, so let's see an example in which one of the parties doesn't understand the proper meaning of a word. Verbal dispute. This is the disagreement about the meaning of a word or words. Example. Now in this example, one of the parties doesn't understand the proper meaning of the word or doesn't understand that a word implies another word. Now, that man is a fancy. No, he's an Akan. Now, this is a disagreement probably among Russians in Russia. Maybe there are two Russians in, in one of the Russian cities and they are arguing about uh, members of ethnic groups in somewhere in Africa. And then one of the Russians says that 
uh, the man on the television is a fanti. And then the second Russian tells him, no, he's an Akan. Probably the second person uh, doesn't know that an Akan, a fanti is an Akan. You know, so he is disagreeing that someone is a fanti because he doesn't know that a fanti is also an Akan, you know, that kind of thing. So when you have a disagreement because someone doesn't know the proper meaning of a word, or someone doesn't know all that a word implies, then what you need to do is to, to sort out that disagreement. You simply say that a fanti is also an Akan, you know, and then the whole disagreement would vanish. Another example is that she's a Christian because she receives Holy Communion. And then someone says, no, she's not a Christian because she does not speak in tongues. You know, so this is a disagreement about what being a Christian means. It's a disagreement about the meaning of Christianity or about the meaning of what it is to be a Christian. You know? So when you see a disagreement about meaning, then it's a verbal disagreement. Then we have the real disagreements. A real disagreement is also called a substantive disagreement about facts or values. Example, if two Americans are arguing, one of them says Accra is the capital of Ghana and the other person says no, Kumasi is the capital of Ghana, then both of them are engaged in a factual disagreement. Factual disagreements are resolved by verifying the facts. So if we go to the map and see that it is a crowd that is named the capital of Ghana, then it means that the American who was arguing that Kumasi is the capital of Ghana was wrong. You know? So factual disagreements are settled by verifying facts. You know, And then you have disagreements about values. For instance, someone believes that, you know, if we are engaged in an argument about which part of Ghana should actually be the capital, and someone says Accra should be the capital, but other people disagree and say that Accra should not be the capital or should not have been the capital then that's a disagreement, that's a value disagreement, you know, because it's a disagreement about people's uh, preferences, people's preferences. Not really a disagreement about what is right and wrong, but a disagreement about uh, uh, which town people think it is most efficient for Ghana to make its capital. If so someone could say, for instance, that, um, Takradi should, uh, should be the capital because it will be most efficient. Or someone can say that Tema should be the capital because it will be the most efficient for the country. Uh -huh. So those are non-moral value disagreements. So these are the real disputes. Then we have this exercise. Determine which of the following disagreement is verbal or real. Which of the following disagreement is verbal or real? So, or sorry, determine whether the following disagreement is verbal or real. Sandra says that man is quite old, he died at 50. Comfort says you call that old, he died young. Is this a verbal or a real disagreement? Do we have people who want to answer? Prince Ahiabad, you want to answer that? Uh, yes. Okay, so um, I believe that it is um, a real uh, dispute. Go ahead, provide reasons. Yeah, um, uh, because yeah, um, because the two of them are uh, not certain on, on the fact that is uh, the real age of the person. So this can be verified by um, asking maybe the, uh, the um, person's relatives at the, at the age at, the, at which the person died. So 
if it is verified, then we can say that oh yeah, okay, this was a real uh, or factual um, dispute. Um, no, the the uh, disag the, disag disagree. the disagreement is not about the age the person died. the The disagreement is not about whether he died at fifty. So the age at which the person died is not being disagreed upon. The disagreement seems to be whether 50 qualifies as, as old age or not. Uh, okay. Sir. Yes. Sir. Yeah, who is so that? I, so, I, so, Gabriel, so I think it is um, a verbal disagreement. So okay. the reason being that. So hello. Go ahead. So the reason being that the Sandra sees the man to be quite old, whilst Comfort sees it to be young. They are not all based on facts. They are all based on their own assumptions. So I think it's a verbal disagreement. Okay, that's fine. What about Portia? Uh, to me, I would say that his, he is not old. Um, hey, am I saying he's not old? It's a, a verbal disagreement or a verbal dispute in the sense that both of them are not certain and there is no fact there that should tell them whether the person is old or not, irrespective of the age. Okay, that's fine. So, um, Nuku. Yeah, sir. I think it's a, a verbal disagreement because um, they are the two of them are not quite sure about uh, what is defined as old and what is defined as young. So fifty is a a, a a tricky age. So they don't know which one is old and which one is young. Okay, fine. What about Sarah? Hello, sir. Yes. Uh, please, I think it's a real disagreement because. Both of them have a different opinion on the age at which you should call it old or something. So it's a real disagreement. Yeah, but, but even in the verbal disagreements, there, there are disagreements about opinion. So what the question is, what is the what class of opinions? What what type of opinions? Is it opinion about meaning or opinion about facts or opinion about values? And then uh, Herbert, Herbert Dankwa. Hello, sir. Yes. Sir, please, I think it's a verbal disagreement. This is because they are both concerned about the age and one of them doesn't understand what it seems to be young when you are 50 or when it seems to be old when you are 50. Thank you. Okay, fine. And then Constantino. Yes, sir. So it, I think it's also a verbal agreement because argument because uh, the the the, the man is old. Yes. Okay, fine. And then uh, someone's microphone was uh, some people's microphones are on, but they didn't raise their hands. All right. So at this point, let's um. Okay, Gloria raised her hand. But okay, so, yeah, so I'm talking. Okay, so, so I'm trying to say that um, with this, it's verbal. It's verbal because they are trying to find meaning to an old age and then a young age. Both persons are, you know, confused with an old age and a young age. So they are trying to find meaning to that pertaining the age of the, the old man. So it's verbal. Okay, fine, fine. Um, all right, so let's move ahead. Um, uh, so what I would say is that um, uh, trying to determine when someone has become old or young is quite tricky because uh, precisely when someone can be seen as old is the problem. There are, there are certain criteria we could use to determine old age. Is that we are using the criteria of criterion of when someone has become weak? Uh, if the person is weak, to what extent 
has a is the person weak to become old? Is it weak enough to stop walking? Weak enough to stop running? Or weak enough to to be unable to get up from the bed? You know, the criteria are so many. You don't know which one to choose. And then regarding which age could qualify as there are some countries where people die, the average death rate is at 70. You know, there are some countries where the average death rate is at 150 years or 120 years. You know, somewhere like Puerto Rico, they live up to 120, 150, you know, according to some scientific studies it is alleged that it is because they eat a lot of potatoes uh, there's also an island in japan where they live up to 150 uh, they said in both in both countries they eat a lot they, they eat a certain kind of potato that uh, doesn't contain too much uh, starch you know there are so many so there are countries where people live an average of more than 100 years in that case, it means that they could be strong until they are probably up to 90. But in countries where people die at an average of 70, 80, it means they will be strong up to 50. There are even some countries where the mortality rate is at uh, the average, uh, you know, death age is uh, 45. You know, some of these countries. There are some African countries with the low, the lowest lifespan, oh sorry, the shortest lifespan on the planet. Um, not necessarily because they are poor, because in fact, what, what mostly causes a uh, short lifespan is uh, eating too much food, eating food that will damage your organs and your arteries, clog up your arteries and those things. So sometimes in, uh, in older age, eating little is better than eating much, you know. So not necessarily because in those countries they are poor, but probably because out of ignorance, they don't know what to do to live long. They probably take too much alcohol, smoke too much, uh, so many things, you know, the, the list might be endless and that kind of thing. So. Uh, then it becomes difficult knowing what is the standard of old age all over the world. You know, so it's a tricky issue. And because of that, the meaning of old age or what age qualifies as old age remains a contested issue, you know. So for that, we can say it's a verbal disagreement, you know. So these are the, the things you, the factors you check before you determine whether something is a verbal or a real disagreement. I just wanted you to understand the difference between both categories of disagreement, you know. So um, I think we are done. This is the last page. Next class, we are going to do normative. The, the difference between the normative and the empirical, and then we're going to do a, lot, a whole lot of other things next class. And then the upper class will begin with argument, which is the second half of the semester. So we're almost done with the first half of the semester. If there are any questions, we'll just take them quickly and then we'll just end and we'll go and enjoy our weekend. Ah. Okay. <laughs> Hey, who's that? Oh, hey, 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 Okay, Baby. so um, Prince Ahiaba, your hand is raised. Uh, all right, so my question, I want to ask whether an argument uh, can uh, contain both real 
and verbal um, um, disputes? Well, sometimes some verbal disputes might look like real ones. You know, especially those ones where you think that the disagreement seems to be that of value instead of that of meaning. Uh, so it depends on how the argument unfolds. If by the very wording, the, the, the very wordings of the argument, the way the argument is worded, they are arguing as if both of them are not on the same page about the meaning of a concept, then it's right. a verbal disagreement. All right. it, it might require verifying facts to correct the meaning of someone. You know, so you, you, then you'll be tempted to say, oh, this is a factual disagreement. Okay. Yeah, but even if it requires verification of facts to correct the meaning someone has of a concept, it still doesn't make it a factual disagreement because the way the disagreement is proceeding shows that it is a disagreement that is arising because someone is arguing with the wrong meaning of a concept. So okay. we, don't, we don't say it is a real dispute or it is a verbal dispute because it will require verification of facts. We say it is a verbal dispute because one of the parties is proceeding on, you know, or even both parties don't have uh, an accurate grasp of the meaning of a concept. They might not be arguing directly about a, the concept, but they are employing the concept in arguing about something else. So the important thing for you as a logician is to see that there is a concept being used in the argument upon which meaning the participants are not yet settled. So that is why you would say that is a verbal disagreement, not because they will require verification to correct it. So Gabriel. Gabriel was raising his hand. All right, so. Please, I I'm the one, I have a question. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Okay, so please, I didn't get the difference. I didn't get the, the differences between the argument and rhetorical polemic. So please, I want you to real call. Argument and rhetorical polemic. Now, yes, an sir. argument is a claim or conclusion surrounded by supporting reasons or information. Yes, sir. But a rhetorical polemic is a collection of emotive expressions that might con that might also contain a claim. Okay. So, so the function of a claim in both types of passages is different. Okay. Now, in a rhetorical polemic, you might make a claim because you are angry um, or you are you feel strongly about something. In a rhetorical polemic your focus is to express your feelings but in order to express your feelings you have to make at least one claim yes, whereas in an argument you make a claim because you want to defend it yes. okay thank you sir yeah, you're welcome. And then, uh, who is that? Is that Prince Ahiaba? Uh, Prince, do you have a question? Or oh, Jennifer, Jennifer Botting. Jennifer, do you have a question? Um, yes, sir. Please, that is live on Sakai. Yeah, go, yeah, you go to the resources section of Sakai. Okay. Yeah, not necessarily this, not really the slides, but the videos. The videos are at the resources section, but the videos contain the slides. When you watch the videos, you are also watching the slides. Okay, thank you, sir. 
All right, and then Kobe. Uh, okay, so Jennifer, you have to raise down your bring down your hand, and uh, Sumaila. Archer Smiler, do you have a question? Yes, sir, please. Can you give an um, example of the rhetorical pol polemic and the other one you were talking about? Yeah, but we saw two examples, unless you logged in very late, because uh, rhetorical polemic, in a rhetorical polemic, you might be expressing your feelings about something, maybe a particular, maybe a hospital uh, that you don't like the way a hospital do their things, you know. But in order for you to say that you don't like the way a hospital does their things, you need to say what the hospital do that you don't like, and that is a claim. So a rhetorical polemic is a claim that is surrounded by emotive expressions. Whereas an argument is a claim that is surrounded with reasons or information. So if you, if you are making an argument, then you can say that you, uh, you can say what the hospital <coughs> is not doing well, or rather you can say that the hospital is not doing well. That's a conclusion, that's a claim. And then your reasons would be that the hospital don't do this well, they don't do that well, and they don't do that well. So you list a couple of things the hospitals don't do well. And those would be information that supports your conclusion that the hospital doesn't do well. <coughs> the difference between a rhetorical polemic and an argument. Oh, okay, sir. So. Then Senanu Tete. Hello. No, Tete, Tete, your audio, your connection is Hello, not sir. at all. Yeah, your connection. Sir, please, please, can you hear me now? Go ahead. Okay, please, uh, I want to ask if the uh, recorded lecture will be posted on Sakai for us. Yeah, it always, lecture. it always is. Okay, always thank is. you. Yes, then JB. JB, and tell please, um, on Mondays, what is the time that we are supposed to meet on Monday? No, not on Monday. I'll, I'll I'm sending another, I'm sending another invitation, but not for Mondays. Oh, okay. Because it seems this week we had a lecture that I missed on Monday, so I was just wondering. Yeah. So starting from next week. Every class that is held on Friday will also be held on Wednesday at the same time. And every class that is held on Saturday will also be held on Thursday at the same time. Then uh, Techno 16, Techno 16. The person who uses Techno 16, do you have a question? Sir. Yes, sir, please. Please, sir, I have a suggestion, sir. Go ahead. I want to play that all have a different. Uh, yeah, I want to play that. Because we have different styles of learning, I will plead that you please upload the slides uh, alone instead of they being in a video yeah the, only the slides so that we can just read them instead of yes sir yeah the reason why i don't post slides is that you don't buy your you Hello? don't buy your textbooks because of slides so for that reason, we don't release slides. We expect you to buy the textbooks, which are more detailed than the slides. The slides are only for the purposes of teaching you. Then Jasmine. Yes, 
the uh, exactly day um, about the re- the verbal. What was the answer? What? The example you gave about the age, a 50 and uh, I didn't get the answer. Yeah, but my explanation should have showed you the answer already, which is verbal. Okay. Then Gloria. Does Gloria has a question? No, sir. Sir, it's as um an announcement I want to make. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Okay, so it's regards to um a Gmail has been you know sent to us via our various Gmail account. So I wanted to let my fellow colleagues know about it, should in case they've not checked yet. Uh huh. So. I- uh, sorry. Uh, could you could you unmute? It appears I muted you by mistake. Okay, so please, can I talk now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so it's about a Gmail you have sent to us. I don't know, I think everyone, yeah, on our Gmail pages. So I wanted to urge the class, if you've not checked yet, kindly go and check so that you know what is about coming. Um, it's about the resources you said you, you normally post on Sakai for us to have an information from there. And also, those of us who haven't joined the WhatsApp group should send their various um, numbers to the main course trip here. I think he's even posted his number in the group. And then an assignment will also be given. Exactly. Which will also be given. Okay, that's good. That's great. And then um, okay. Godfrey. Sir. Sir. Go ahead. Uh, I will- I, I want to ask, apart from Fridays, when do we meet again, or is only Fridays? I was, I was saying that any class that holds on Fridays would also hold on Wednesday at the same time, about the same time. Uh, okay, does it mean uh, we meet only on uh, Wednesdays and Fridays? No, I said any class that holds on Friday, we also hold on Wednesday by the same time. Oh, okay. okay. And then Samuel. Okay, Samuel didn't raise his hand. So this is the end of the class. Next class will begin. Next class is what? Next class is likely to be Wednesday next week. By this time, I'll send, I'll modify our, our link and then I'll send it so that it is, it will be showing you double classes instead of. Uh, a single class. So, right, so I wish everyone a happy weekend and uh, I'll see you in the next class. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. 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 Thank Come on. Assignment, assignment. No assignment. We'll see. We'll see.